Hello and welcome to the Canning Gordon Show today's Best Country Mix. And joining me right here today is Dave Lowe. Dave, how are you? I'm good. Nice to speak to you again. Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> yeah, and down... for those of you that don't know, we had some uh, tech issues last time. So we're here back and doing it again. From Australia, <laughs> that place in the far off distance. <laughs> yep. Pretty much on the whole other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you start by uh telling everyone a little bit about you well um yeah thank you so i my mother was hungarian she was a famous dancer in europe i uh, met my father in london during the war of course there have been so many wars i'm talking about the second world war during the blitz in london he was a dance band leader they moved to africa to kenya to escape at the end and i was born there and started playing the cello at six because one of mom's brothers was a cellist but not a pro and lost his life in the holocaust that everyone knows about and uh, i just you know ducked to water and i went professional when we moved to australia and i was about 23 mm -hmm. so i worked with all the big orchestras um in melbourne then i moved to london joined the London Symphony Orchestra in the late 70s, mm -hmm. which was certainly then the best orchestra mm -hmm. in the world. It was quite sensational. With Andre Previn, who I know, probably everyone in the USA knows who Andre was. And we lost him recently, but I was solo cello for a year with a special production. Made my first album in 87 in Australia, which went platinum. Uh, run my own record label in the UK. And through my own sales, I'm one of the top selling classical Australian artists on what I've done, very crossover. I love doing crossover music because of my showbiz back. So awesome. that's a bit about me. Very cool. So um, if you could do a duet or collaboration with any singer, Dave, who would you choose and why? Oh, I'm very much into, uh, I think I like Pink. I like Miley Cyrus. I just like... Um, you know, I love doing things that are a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, there's some very cool people out there. Maybe something with Ed Sheeran would be nice on cello, cello and guitar. Um, yeah, you know, I like to go into different waters with the cello. Mm -hmm. um, some of my early press used to say I was a bit of an Indiana Jones of the cello. It's a bit cliche these days, isn't it? But I like being adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because I was born in Africa, that's why. <laughs> Lions, Definitely. First, you never know. First audience was a line when I was six years old. There's an old boy used to come and sit at the bottom of the uh, garden and he couldn't eat, so we used to feed him. And he seemed, he seemed to like the music. So all real, all true. Everything I'm saying is true. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about any uh, new singles or any upcoming projects you're looking forward to talking about, Dave? Well, thank you. So 222 is marked my 50th year in the music industry. And as I say to friends, still standing, that's a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Being through a few, you know, ups and downs like we all do. Um, but it's a hard industry and you have to be very tenacious and determined and persevere. Mm -hmm. So we brought out the album For the Love of the Cello, which is off my catalog. And it's a reflection that I love doing. Um, I love Elvis Presley. So you got Can't Help Falling in Love, Marie's the Name, Love Sting, mm -hmm. Love John Barry. Dance as well. So there's 16 wonderful tracks there. Now, apologies, I think 23. And that's getting some nice reviews. Um, it's getting very good station hits. So that's my current album. And um, I have other ideas. I'd love to do some Neil Diamond and things in the future. Love Rod Stewart. I've moved away from classical because I think it's just been done so many times by cellists and things. And um, I just like to do things that are different but always with the classical core at times you know a real child mm -hmm. so that's the current one um for the love of the cello ruined the whole my, my life and yeah just six years old <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure so um why don't you tell us a little bit about any uh hobbies interests anything like that you got going on dave what do you like doing outside of music yeah, well, I guess I'm a bit of a passionate, very passionate man, Hungarian blood for you. I love model cars. I've got a huge die cast collection. 
Um, it's a passion. Started in England. I was living on my own. I used to love going out to toy fairs and church halls, and it was quite overwhelming. And it just kind of took me over. But a happy part of my childhood, I guess. I love books. I love movies. I love action films. I'm uh, not really good on soppy films. <laughs> um, I love swimming. Bit of weight training event, hopefully next year. Um, yeah, I just love, you know, I love drifting in a cafe. I love cars. I had a lovely car. I've got an 86. I think they drive them in America now, the um, G86, the Toyota. So I'm very lucky to have a nice car. So a bit of a usual boring git, you know, <laughs> likes fast cars. And, <laughs> and uh, I love my mother car collection. And uh, I'm a very big pet lover. I've got a gorgeous cat. I lost my mum at Easter, which is very sad. She was 101. And I've looked after her for three years. And so, you know, I'm very close to my cat now. Animals are so healing, you know, they're very therapeutic. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, I have here two dogs and a cat, and they're definitely. Oh, sure. good man. Oh, lovely. What dogs are they? <laughs> um, I have a golden doodle, mm -hmm. and then we have a hundred and I think he, she's like 150 pound bull mastiff. Oh, the old Mastiff. Uh huh. Mastiff. Oh, they're big dogs. So I guess you don't have any burglaries, any issues with that. <laughs> nope, never. Uh, so I just want to get, there's a bit of a box on here. I just don't want to touch and get something wrong, but I'll let Fleur have a look. I just got a little box here saying about it's been recorded and I'm too scared to touch anything. So just leave you it. You're it. good. You're good. good. I still got you. So I know dogs in, in my book, I had a beautiful Alsatian in Kenya called Rusty. He was an Alsatian Ridgeback. Mm -hmm. And he used to come hunting with me. And, you know, when people came to see us, he'd sit down and offer them his paw. So I've got a soft spot for animals. I love pets. I support the World Wildlife Fund. I love koalas, you know. And to me, animals first, people second. <laughs> yes, course, definitely. Yeah. Born in Africa, I guess, you know. Is there something in particular that you love about where you uh, came from? Because I know you talked about that a lot. Yeah, it was very special. I mean, I love the people. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that, um, yeah, we had a, a farm, you know, it was in the, near the wilderness. Um, we had a very lot of diverse people from all over Europe, a lot of refugees. Yeah, it was a happy time, you know. Um, there was, um, I was very happy at a primary school, but on the other hand, there's always two sides of the coin. What I did not like there, I had a very, very bad of traumatic bullying, which is very much a topic in Australia at the moment. Um, school bullying, siblings, a lot that's not talked about are young siblings bullying each other. And after my mum passed, a lot of things came out for me. I actually discovered that my own sister abused me very much when I was very small. But the bullying at school was very bad in Kenya. There was a small white society. There was a lot of, you know, um, infidelity. Kids were dumped at boarding school and they would go rampant. And I really got tormented because I played the cello. I was called a sissy. Um, I was humiliated. And the, the key thing now, the message I'd like to get across to people is that they don't know what the kids are doing to the kids. What they're actually right. doing is possibly ruining their lives because I suffer from bipolar, which is now well contained, but it's a trauma. And I know why now I could not, I flunked all my school studies. I loved my, my studies, but nothing could be taken in. And that's the damage they're doing. And I would love to do a school tour and just advocate that. And then people say to me, you know, uh, look, tell me if I'm talking too much. But people say to me, see, I did an interview the other day with Canberra, right? And he said, well, look, what do you think people do? I said, I'll tell you what I think they should do. The parents need to be more switched on. So when the kids come home, say, how was your day? Mm -hmm. Were you bullied? No, mom. Did you bully somebody? Tell me what was going on. We oh well, yeah, yeah. We were giving this kid a hard time because he's got funny hair and and everything. I said, well, look, you must understand. That's when they should talk and say, look, young man, whatever your name is, you're doing that child a lot of damage. You don't know what you're going to do to him in his later life. Just be friends with him. Give him a hug. 
Um, and if that's not happening, go to the school. Meet the parents of that child. You don't have to be nasty. Take them outside and have a talk to them. Say, look, do you know what your child is doing to mine? How dare you? You're going to wreck his life. You must understand that. Oh, somebody said to me, oh, yeah, well, my little boy loves ballet. And the Australian ballet, for example, is one of the best in the world. So he's going to get a really bad time because he wants to do ballet. So, well, look, right. drop your iPhone, get off that phone, leave your, your online streaming, go into the class and sit there and watch. And if the teachers don't like it, well, tough. Just say in a nice way, well, look, I'm concerned about my child. I've had he's been bullied. Are you going to do something about it or I will? Let's bring a bit about of some, let's bring about, about a bit of hard control and, and firmness. And I feel that's very important now. I have to 100% agree. I think uh, mm -hmm. bullying yeah, everywhere yeah. is. Uh, an mm. issue even here in the u.s it's an issue so is it so one of those That's things yes yes absolutely uh, oh i wonder what's doing it you know i think it's personally i've got a quick i got a quick summation i think it's this absorption with iphones and online and streaming and losing contact with you know fellow children in a physical normal way like playing games or hobbies and things and so they become almost like they don't exist it's like somebody online and they just lose that reality contact that you only get, like dating, all this online stuff. Yeah. Go and meet the person, just have a coffee. And maybe that's the part of it. I don't know. I'm no expert. I've seen things that have that has that does have a big impact on it, but also at the same time, it depends on who's online, you know. It's more easier to get away, I feel like, with bullying and not and you gotta figure out like who it is. It's more easier to bully online than it is, you know, and that's happening more mm. mainly online than it is in person now. That's just how it's going. Like it's an online thing. Same in Australia. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I think that's the part, you know, it's all these great virtues, like with yeah. music, it's always got a big downsides too. And I don't know quite what the answer is going to be there, but maybe it'll come back, you know, in, in a cycle of some format. But the more people get in contact with each other, real. But I think a lot of it's up to parents and adults to yeah, yeah. be more switched on educationally. But again, you see, there's all this talk, talk. We have a big program here called Q&A. And people just waffle and talk and talk and bounce ideas and everybody cheers and claps. But what, do they change anything? Not really. Get me a microphone. I'll get on that show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sure you will. I think you'd be a really good advocate knowing that it's knowing the, the risks and everything. I, you should really consider that maybe going to a school Thank near you. you and talking about that. I think that's important. Really. I'm not kidding yeah. here. I think it's really important. And I think, I, am I allowed to add something very quickly and briefly? Because first looking at me. Sure. Um, sure. You know, I think what's missing now in the young people today, and I love them. I think we've got great people. Though. We all know there's some amazing people. What seems to disappear is having resilience. Yeah. And in a course, so when they hit a brick wall, like COVID or something, they're, yeah. they're, they're floundering. And I think a lot of that's to do with the loss of one to one contact. Uh -huh. Look at my mother. She went through the Holocaust. Both her brothers were shot down by Russians on the front. Her grandparents were nearly executed three times. And yet she got through that. She lived on biscuits and tea in London before she got mm -hmm. her first show. They had to sell their wedding ring to buy food. You know, and that kind of era is gone. And I'm not condemning what's happening now, but I just think it's a shame that, you know, we're losing that resilience, even in adult population. People haven't got the stamina to, to carry through. I guess I'm lucky because I've had that background. Mm -hmm. And that's why I try and encourage more self-respect. doesn't matter how old you are. Believe in yourself. Look in the mirror and smile, you know, and be good and... Be nice to your school kids and whatever you're doing. Definitely. I feel, very, I feel that very strongly. There's something missing now. It's this age of technology and mm -hmm. online and, you know, I have a friend who works at work, you know, she's online. She's a wonderful software. She's a great friend of mine. She's from Columbia, but uh -huh. she always goes to the office at least twice a week at North Sydney 
to be in that physical contact zone. Otherwise, you just become a, you know, a person on the cyber. Right. Well, that's right. Laura, her. We don't really know her. So he's got, you've got that marriage yep. of both working together. And I think it's just gone completely one sided. Anyway, I'm no expert. I'm just, hopefully, I'm not boring your listeners. <laughs> oh, no, I think it's super important to talk about. I do want to kind of jump back into the music part of it, though. So, um, sure. Sure. where can people find you on uh, social media if they want to keep up with what you're up to, Dave? So, um, the website if is um, Dave LOE dot LOEW, Dave Lowe dot com dot AU, has to have the AU. That's got a huge website. Um, it's all streaming on Spotify, Apple, um, iTunes, a lot of the other sites. You can still get the CD discs through my own record label, and it's called Music Lives Forever dot com. Ambition Entertainment, they're actually selling out CDs. I hear rumours that the CD market is starting to re-emerge again, and classics and retro, which would be lovely. We're all for that, but... Um, so it's all on streaming online, but um, personally, I think this is the day of the CD, we'd love you to see them back again. Just the fact that you've got the artwork, you've got the packaging, mm -hmm. and you've got something tangible to hold, like a book. Mm -hmm. Call me old fashioned. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, some people I talk to are not at like wanting CDs at all. Like, we don't have CDs. We're we're so like, no. but it really yeah. all depends on the age and how long you've been doing it for. Because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are like, you know, you're young. Why do you even want CDs? Well, I mean, I I like best of both worlds. I look at it that mm. way. So me too. A lot of people have got huge CD collections, you know, especially classic uh -huh. ones. Yeah. So I think there's always going to be a market for them. But the online stream, of course, the quality has really got better and better and better. Right, and Spotify's right. great. So all my stuff is a catalogue. If your listeners might like to know, this isn't just the other album. I've done Romance of a Cello, um, The Beatles, at the movies. I did it at Pinewood Studios in London. Big film tracks like uh, The Godfather, Lawrence of Arabia, even, you know, um, big tracks like that. Band of Brothers, done with full orchestra. So there was some several albums out there that they can access to and I hope that's awesome probably. and hopefully they will download and uh i'll see if things happening chinga chinga chink you never know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know anything to help support us is definitely good and i don't know if you're trying to do like the money sound that's what it sounded like to you, but i wasn't 100 sure so okay yeah, that's what i thought well, i just well. wasn't sure <laughs> My hands up, I admit it. Yeah, I think a lot of people funny. didn't realize when online first started, I think a lot of people thought, well, you know, it's money for nothing, mm -hmm. you know, but there's a cost factor involved. Yep. There's always yep. a cost factor involved. Um, I'd need, you know, a lot of streaming million hits to get my return, yeah. but that's not really my goal. Right, right. It's about giving pleasure and getting my music out there. But of course, it's always nice to get something back financially. But... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's super, even if it's like, you know, donating to you, me, another mm. artist. It, I mean, it really helps us all, honestly. Of course it does. It's a two, it's a cycle, isn't it? It's a two-way stream. You know, any recording costs money now, um, yeah. whether you do it in studio or arranging's expensive. I had some of the yeah. best arrangers. And I'd like people to know that on your side, that what's made my music so amazing is it's not my playing the cello which I know is very good, but it's some yeah. of the best arrangers um, who've worked on James Bond. They've worked on, uh, on, on films like John Barry, who worked on James Bond. I've done that Bond album, which is on that thing, James Bond, yeah. the essential movie themes. Great films, you know, that, um, you know, Live and Let Die, Skyfall, Adele. Um, they all cost big bucks to get those arranged. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking hundreds or you're talking thousands. So um that's that's the side of what's made them i think so timeless is the quality mm -hmm. of the arranging i mean dances with wolves is as good as the film track gladiators on there yeah so i've been a lucky guy in london there was some amazing people to work with it's a team effort you know yeah it sure is well dave is there anything i forgot to mention that you would like to mention my friend I don't think now. I just say I'm very privileged that people in the US are taking some interest in me and my music. Um, I'm kind of really thrilled and very, 
very glad about that and so lovely to speak to you and I thank you enormously. It's really lovely, thank you. And I hope that they will respond and enjoy the music and go online. Um, I will say quickly that the book I did, uh, my autobiography called I Am Cellist, very exciting, came out in Australia last year. It's got a world contract release later this year and it's going to be available in the USA. I'm not too sure when. I hope by the end of this year, I Am Cellist, which is my autobiography of show business, my family, working across a whole number of things in my music and what the family happened to them during the wars and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's already online. And I'd love people to know about the book. They can find that online as well. But it will be in bookstores. Awesome. In the US, I'm terribly excited about that. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll definitely have to uh, check it out for you. Please, oh, I'll, I'll get you a copy, no worries. Awesome. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Kate and Gordon Show today's Best Country Makes. We appreciate it so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope we'll talk again one day. <laughs> Thanks again. Brilliant. Great.